we've got Caroline Lucas, um, Honorary Vice President of the Campaign Against Climate Change and Green MEP for the South East and possible Green Party leader in the future. So please to welcome Caroline. Well, it is brilliant to see you all here. And you know, we might be a bit cold and we might be a bit wet, but we are not disheartened because we are part of the biggest, most important climate justice movement in the world. So it is fantastic that you are here and thank you for coming. You know, for the past few climate marches we've been gathering outside the US Embassy, because George Bush's refusal to act on climate change makes him guilty of crimes against humanity. But I'm thinking that we're going to have to start meeting outside Downing Street as well. Because if George Bush is guilty of climate vandalism, then Gordon Brown is a willing accomplice to that crime. Because George Bush and Gordon Brown just don't get it. But Gordon Brown, how can he make his first green speech on Monday of the week and on the first day he gives an announcement in favour of a third runway at Heathrow Airport? So, Gordon Brown, watch my lips. You cannot expand aviation and reduce emissions. Airport expansion has to stop. And we have a very clear message then for Gordon Brown today and our message is this that climate change is a much greater threat than international terrorism and it is itself a weapon of mass destruction and if this government had spent one fraction of the political commitments and money on tackling climate change that it spends instead on an illegal war in Iraq, then the world would be a much safer place. And our message is as well that you cannot endlessly trade your way out of this problem through emissions trading. And our message is as well that it is time to get real. We have to start here and we have to start now. But we have a long way to go. This is a government under whom greenhouse gas emissions have risen, not fallen. This is a government that thinks unnecessary, unsafe and economic nuclear power is the answer. And this is a government which is enthusiastically supporting the EU's new obsession with biofuels rather than recognising that the mass death for biofuels is undermining climate change, is undermining climate justice and is making people hungry across the world. And so we say it is unacceptable to put the desire of car drivers in the West before food for people in the developing world. We want crops for food, not for fuel. And the primary challenge of climate change isn't a scientific challenge, it's not an economic challenge, it's not a technical challenge, it is simply a challenge of political will. Will we be able to muster sufficient public commitment and political will to put in place the changes that we know are so urgently needed. The massive investment in renewable energies and energy efficiency, the investment in public transport, the replanning of our towns and our cities. So we urgently need a mandatory policy framework, but that framework has to be based on the science, not on what governments say is politically feasible. And so while we welcome the climate change bill, we have to challenge the targets in that climate change bill. Because as they stand now, they will lead to four to five degrees warming, not to keeping below two degrees warming. 
So we have to get the right targets. We have to say that what is politically feasible has to be what guarantees a livable planet, not what guarantees the biggest returns to the transnational corporations and their shareholders. And so our message is, and the Green Party's message specifically is, that we cannot tackle climate change using the same economic paradigm of endless economic growth that caused the crisis in the first place. And the good news is that there is an alternative out there. It's the alternative that's been put forward by the Global Commons Institute on Contraction and Convergence that is the only global equitable system and all credit to, global, uh, to the Global Commons Institute for all their work on that. I'm getting to that, honestly. Come on. I want to say that we need that global framework of contraction and convergence. We also need a national system of personal carbon rationing because that is the only realistic way for making the emission cuts that we need fast enough and it's the only way of dealing with peak oil. But I want to end by saying we need personal action as well and I am going to make one key suggestion for all of you here today and it's not about having more efficient light bulbs important though that is, it's not about going by bus important though that is, it is about what we eat. It's been said that livestock emissions account for the same amount of global greenhouse gases as all the global transport sector in the whole world. This is something simple that everybody can do. If we reduce the amount that we eat, we can have a big difference on the planet. It's been said, and think about this, that a vegan driving a 4x4, God help you if you do, I hope you don't, but a vegan driving a 4x4 does less damage to the environment than a meat eater on a bicycle. I leave you with that thought. Thing, and that is that some people say that we will never be able to build the public support that we need in order to bring these changes about. And I say that just simply means that we have to get better at communicating our positive vision of a zero carbon economy. A positive vision of a zero carbon economy recognises that the future for all of us can be a safer future, a better future, a future of better quality of life. Economic growth is not what makes us happy. Relationships and our own, uh, that's what makes us happy. And so when we think that Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King had a dream, not a nightmare. We've got to get better about communicating our dream of a greener, safer, better future. We can start here and now. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of that movement.